I want to welcome everybody here to the Groton Alpern Awards Dinner. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, our alumni across the generations who are here, the students, the faculty, and the staff. It's really a thrill to have you here tonight. I want to make a few special thanks to some of our special guests tonight. I want to thank Jerry Alpern, 49, who is here again. I want to thank our former deans who've come back, Ed Lawler, Harry Katz, Kevin Halleck. One of the great things about ILR is that people stay at ILR. They keep coming back to ILR because ILR is a community that we belong to and we stay with over time. I want to thank all the previous winners of the prestigious awards. And I want to make a special comment about a couple of people who we lost this year, former award winners. Harold Levy, class of 1975, who received the Alpern Award in 2001, and Alan Kruger, class of 1983, who received the Grote Award in 2013. And I was wondering if we could just have a couple of moments of silence just in memory of two great ILREs that we lost this year. Thank you. Those losses remind us that this community that we have, that is the ILR community, is one that's precious. It's something that needs to be nurtured and continued. This has been a year of debate and a year of change for ILR. I did not expect to be here a year ago. But that's something that's OK at ILR. We learn about change at ILR. ILRs are comfortable with change, with debate, with discussion. We see change and we embrace it, but we remain solid to our core. The world's leading school of work. We study labor, employment, the workplace. That's our core and that continues on. We do say goodbye to some things as well. This was a year when we said farewell from the faculty to a couple of really great faculty who retired. Uh, David Lipsky retired after 50 years on the ILR faculty. Just show of hands, how many people were students of David Lipsky? Took a class with David Lipsky. Yeah, I, I've got my hand up too. That's the impact that our faculty have had over the years. Sam Bacharach, great organizational behavior scholar, retiring after over four decades on the faculty. But like many ILREs, he's not leaving forever. He's continuing on directing our Smithers Institute while a retiree. You get into ILR and you don't leave. You stay. You continue on. ILR is the School of Industrial Labor Relations. People sometimes hear that name and think that we're maybe a school stuck in the past. Well, it's true. We do have a glorious past. We're very proud of that past. But ILR is also a school that looks to the future, looks to the future of work. And today, we see that our issues, ILR issues, are more and more at the forefront of debates, of practice in the field. We ask questions. How is technology transforming work? Will self-driving cars and artificial intelligence take away jobs? What will work be like in the gig economy? What are the future of jobs in a global economy where jobs can move across oceans at the click of a button? How is migration affecting labor markets? As you may be able to tell, I'm an immigrant myself. I came to America. Immigrants are coming, building our economy. How is that affecting our labor markets? The issues of ILR are becoming more and more prominent. We think about things like the issues raised by the Me Too movement that are challenging how we protect fairness in our workplaces. We think about issues like the universal basic income, the fight for 15. These are ILR issues. They're at the center of our public debates. And ILR is engaged in those debates. We're doing research on them. We're debating them in our classrooms. And our alumni are out there engaged in the policy and practice affecting these debates. ILR is speaking to the future of work. And we are central to the debates that are going on. The skills that our students learn have never been more relevant. We still love reading. 
right? ILRs love reading, but we also love big data now. We love to debate, we love to argue. We're comfortable with conflict, and we know how to resolve it. We understand both labor and management perspectives. We think about the key issues for the American economy, but more and more we also understand the global economy. ILR is internationally focused. We are the world's greatest school of work, and that gives us hope for the future. I'll say when I look out at our alumni, that's what really gives me hope about ILR. When I see our alumni out there engaged in their careers, the successes that they achieve are the successes of the school. That tells us that we are achieving the education that is our mission as a school. You are part of the ILR community, and that's the great thing about ILR. It's a community that will carry through your whole life. Now tonight, it's my pleasure to honor two of our great alumni our Grote and Alpern Award winners, our highest awards for alumni. And it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Carolyn Richmond and Diane Rosen, our two award winners tonight. I'm gonna start with Carolyn Richmond, our Grote Award winner. Uh, the Grote Award is our long-standing award established in 1971 in honor of Judge Grote, who served as the counsel to the New York State Joint Legislative Committee, uh, playing a pivotal role in founding the school. It connects back to the history of our school and honors somebody, an alumnus with distinction in our field uh, in their career. <laughs> Carolyn Richmond is a person of amazing achievements in her career. She's chair of the Hospitality Practice Group and former co-chair of the Labor and Employment Department at Fox Rothschild, where she represents and counsels employers across the hospitality industry, specifically restaurants, hotels, caterers, nightlife, fitness centers. If there's any issues, labor issues break out tonight, we're covered. We've got Carolyn here. We're ready to deal with it. She's an expert on hiring processes, diversity awareness, tipping. Next time I'm not sure what to tip, I'm going to be sure to text Carolyn. Tip your waiters, that's the key message. Carolyn serves as Chief Labor Counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance and has been active since the organization's inception. She formerly served as General Counsel to Be Our Guest Restaurants and James Hotels, where she led the legal team, as well as helping expand those businesses. One of the things I'm most impressed, though, is how a loyal Cornelian she has been. She served on a variety of Cornell uh, boards, including the President's Council of Cornell Women, the Alumni Board of Directors, the Advisory Board for our Institute for Hospitality, Labor and Employment Relations, and a member of our ILR Advisory Council. That giving back to Cornell is inspiring, the effort to stay committed and to support our Cornell community. And for Carolyn, Cornell has really been a family affair. I had to note down all the different people in, Cornell's, in Carolyn's family who are Cornellians, beginning with her father, her sister, her brother, her cousin, and now the latest addition, her niece Maddie. So an amazing Cornell family. And she's not just a great legal expert. This is kind of fascinating. Uh, Carolyn actually had a brief affiliation with the US Secret Service. She took defensive driving lessons in order to drive staff and press in the Clinton presidential motorcade. Uh, she's not just a badass driver, though. She also sang in the choir at the Kennedy Center Honors event for Billy Joel's recognition ceremony, and she was even featured on an episode of HGTV's Selling New York. And last but not least, I did notice she is going to be our first winner of a Grotter Alpern Award from a class in the 1990s. So any of you who are 90, 90s classes, uh, this is setting the path for the future, and we're going to see lots more great 1990s winners. So please let, join me in congratulating Carolyn Richmond, our winner of the 2019 <laughs> Judge Grote Award. Please. Carolyn, please come up.
had a whole speech prepared, but the dean just took all of my points. <laughs> so you're going to have to listen all over again. But thank you, Dean Colvin. Thank you to the Dean's Advisory Council, the Alumni Association, my fellow alumni, friends, family, Jerry Alpern, it's an honor to be here as well. And congratulations to Diane Rosen, to her husband, Mark. You'll hear from them. They are the first dual uh, couple receiving this. I've spent the better part of six months thinking about this night and what I would say. As the saying goes, it takes a village. My successes and achievements were not done in a vacuum. I have a great many people to thank tonight, and I do hope all of you will bear with me. First, I want to thank and acknowledge my mentors, Marty Scheinman, Carol Wittenberg, Paul Salvatore, Harry Katz, my partner Stephen Plaskow, where, wherever you are, Lori Burke Weiss, and Ruth Raisfeld. Collectively, you've all opened my eyes to new opportunities and ideas, and I am indebted to each of you for providing me sage advice, friendship, help at many stages, and other things that I will share later, but I am very appreciative of all of you. I also can't stand here tonight without thanking Professor Sam Backrack, who, while we may hear that he's retiring, apologized for not being here because I believe he's teaching and leading a course. So I don't expect retirement's really going to stop him. Uh, but back in September 1987, Sam lit a spark inside of me during our very first um, organizational behavior class. He also scared me, but he lit that spark. Six classes and four years later, he taught me how to think. Sam's lessons in power, leadership, his friendship, and his encouragement stayed with me for the last 30 years, and I am very appreciative to him for that. I also owe a very special thanks to the Office of Student Services and three incredible people who are no longer with us, Dick Wagner, Jim McPherson, and Ginny Freeman. As they no doubt did with countless other ILRs, they helped guide, they deserve an applause, They help guide a somewhat wide-eyed and a occasionally bewildered teenager through the halls of Ives. Thank you, and I am indebted to all three of you. While I'm also no wallflower and very rarely play second fiddle to anyone, in the ILR community, I've always been known as the other Carolyn. Carolyn Jacobson was a role model for me in many ways, not least of which she taught me how to be a better aunt to my nieces and and nephews who are here tonight. It's been a year since we lost Carolyn, and the light here is a little dimmer without her smiling face, as she no doubt would be all over this room. However, it's a family affair, and I am very lucky and honored to call her nephew, Glenn, my business partner, my sparring partner, and most importantly, one of my best friends. So to Myron and Michelle, I'm not sure where you are out there, to Glenn, Clarice, and Daniel, I will always and forever be the other Carolyn. Finally, and just with respect to thank yous, there's, there's a lot more to go. I want to turn to my family. While I'm rarely at a loss of words, there are a few that can explain just how happy I am and how honored I am that my parents are here tonight. Their unconditional love and support has meant everything over my, well, now 50 years. Growing up, my father sparked a love of Cornell in all of his children and now his grandchildren. In my family, and we also take Big Red very literally. <laughs> he passed on a love of learning and firmly set my moral compass. My mother, Margie, is also an example of achievement, self-respect, and resilience. While I was growing up, she worked, ran our house, earned two graduate degrees, and raised four kids. Long before work-life balance became a thing, my mother did it all. If anyone questions where I get my strength, fortitude, and confidence, the person sitting in the front row, and I am my mother's daughter. <laughs> On a lighter note, I'm very happy to have my siblings here. Between us, we did earn six Cornell degrees, but in fairness, my sister Nancy earned three of them. She, she's the youngest, she had to make sure she was ahead. Jeff got two and I only had one. But we all overlapped at Cornell and while we may fight on occasion, they remain my gut check, my cheerleaders, and my confidants. And I appreciate and love them, but I do wanna point out I'm mom and dad's favorite tonight. <laughs> I'm also very proud, as the Dean mentioned, that my 
niece Maddie is going to be starting the engineering school this fall. There are five more kids behind them, and I hope at least one of them uh, chooses ILR. Now, over the past few months, I have thought about the platform and opportunity I have tonight in addressing all of you. As we begin to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of ILR by a group of individuals who included Judge Grote, I thought this was a unique opportunity to address how relevant the school is today. ILR had a simple mission in 1944, to educate a student body on the employment relationship in all of its forms. While the workplace has changed dramatically over those 75 years, the school's mission has remained the same. It's simple enough, and despite monumental sea changes in the world of work, ILR remains as relevant and as vital as ever. In 1944, the NLRA was in its infancy. There was still tension between the AFL and the CIO, but partisanship was not nearly as divisive as it is today. The founding of ILR brought together Democrats, Republicans, management, and labor. That kind of bipartisanship, unfortunately, is only aspirational today, but our school stands as an example of what all the stakeholders can do together. Thanks to our faculty, administration, and alumni, the ILR curriculum has regularly been reassessed and adapted to the workplace needs of the day. Personnel management begat human resources. Labor law expanded to in include employment and civil rights law. A somewhat myopic approach to the world and the workplace has now begat a revised curriculum today that now encourages study abroad. And to my consternation, or I guess I'm glad I didn't have to go through it, we now require a for foreign language and advanced math. <laughs> Keep those left. My oldest friends are here tonight. One taught me how to read, and one taught me how to use numbers. So one of you did a better job than the other. <laughs> I am a labor, law, labor lawyer. There is very little of my Cornell education that has not had a direct impact in my career, and that includes statistics. I often reflect back on Professor George Boyer and the lessons learned from the Industrial Revolution and Frederick Taylor. These lessons from Econ 140 have helped me better understand current issues in my own practice and industry. The fight over the tip credit, the drive for $15 an hour, as the dean mentioned, cross-training and how to structure a restaurant workplace to be more efficient. I'm as surprised as anyone when phrases such as, we should take a look at Taylorism as an example of, comes out of my mouth. And that has come out of my mouth several times. The link between ILR my ILR education and my legal practice today happens routinely. Yesterday's history lessons become today's building blocks. We may not be a big school, but our impact on the world of work is dramatic. The skill set we learn at ILR is adaptable and usable in any workplace, whether it's a unionized hospital or steel mill, a major league baseball team, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, or a not-for-profit. ILR alums, in my opinion, are utility players whose value goes well beyond the bargaining table or the human resources office. For better or worse, the Me Too movement has also helped move our skill set front and center where it belongs to be, where it belongs. When I graduated in 1991, the workplace did not look significantly different than it did in the 1950s or 1960s. Granted, 50 years has certainly added more diversity to the rank and file, but desktop, com desktop computers were just barely entering many of our offices in 1991. Most offices still look the same as they did 30 or 40 years ago. Brick and mortar spaces, appropriate business tires still meant suits and ties and pantyhose, uh, but all that has now gone out the window. Over the past 25 years, we've had an amazing resilience in the workplace and many changes that have include throwing out dress codes, throwing out windows. Um, when I graduated in 1991, co-sharing jobs, telecommuting, and we work were still decades away. And the idea that a choice of pronouns would be a question on an application was simply inconceivable. The last 30 years has seen dramatic changes, and the school, like the workplace, has adapted and grown. ILR has added institutes and courses of study that reflect the way we work today. And I believe we have 12 
institutes that directly link the workplace with research and pragmatic approaches to the workplace today. There has been some talk and some rumor this past year that perhaps ILR should be absorbed into other schools or some of our departments combined with others. I believe that's now safely a rumor put to bed. But I think that those who've entertained these ideas, <laughs> those who have entertained these ideas just don't have a full appreciation for the uniqueness of the ILR school and its alumni. We are dogged. Uh, the dynamic role we shape in the workplace every day can often be seen, as, as the Dean alluded to, on the front page of newspapers and on blogs all around the country. We're a unique school that combines theory, research, and academic excellence with practical skills and approaches, something I am forever grateful with. Frankly, little makes me more excited than a 12-hour mediation with an ILR as a plaintiff's attorney, a mediator also from the ILR school, and a client who's usually a hotelie. <laughs> We're only missing hot truck from those mediations. And as Carol knows, I complain about the jams food all the time. So maybe we'll get hot truck up there. But I'm very proud of being an alumni of Cornell University and the ILR school. I am incredibly grateful for everything they have given me. The ILR school and the Cornell community has given me so much that I can't possibly say thank you enough. But thank you again for honoring me with the William H. Grote Award. It is my humble honor and, and pleasure to accept it. Thank you. For our second award tonight, we'll be presenting the Jerome Alpern Award. This was established in 1997, named in honor of Jerome Alpern, 49, here tonight, whose contributions of outstanding service and support to the ILR School, students, alumni, combined with his professional accomplishments outside the field of industrial labor relations, embody the essence and spirit of the Alpern Award, something that we see in our graduates. They are leaders in the field of labor and employment relations, but they also have great success in the fields of business, government, public service, and we're really proud of those successes. Tonight's awardee, Diane Rosen, embodies that success in the broad fields that our alumni go into. She's a lawyer, currently of counsel to Ortelli Rosenstadt, and has a brilliant legal career prior to that, working with such prestigious firms as Skadden Arps, her specialty, is in real estate and corporate transactions, and she has expertise in US copyright law. But she's a real Renaissance woman. She is a mediator and conflict coach, specializing in custody and visitation. In addition to practicing law, she's an author. She collects art, including WPA era prints. WPA, this will be on the exam. What does that stand for? In thematic areas, urban landscape, social commentary, industrial design. She also is a founding vice president of Girls Learn International, a nonprofit that works to combat the global crisis in girls' education. And she's another example of that great connection of loyal Cornellians serving our university in various functions, the Cornell University Council, the President's Council of Cornell Women, the Cornell Council on Sexual Violence, and continuing that public spiritedness outside of Cornell, serving on the boards of Planned Parenthood, New York City, New York French American Charter School, uh, and really embodying what I think is really that ILR spirit of service to the university and then service to the community. She's really gone beyond, though, just serving on committees. She's helped for us at Cornell creating events for students, most recently an event to address sexual harassment in the workplace, one of the great issues of our day. And on campus, she held special sessions for students to discuss the issue, to ask questions. Diane has a special place for me because when I came back to Cornell as a faculty member, she was one of the first alumni I really got to know. And I don't think I really understood until I came back how much our alumni contribute back to Cornell, the depth of their commitment over time, and how much they mean to our students, 
to our campus, to our community. And Diane really taught me that role of our alumni. So it's a great pleasure to me tonight to be giving the Alpern Award to Diane Rosen. Please come up, Diane. Okay, so I'm going to keep this short because I've been waiting for my martini, <laughs> and, which I have not yet had a chance to have. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to everybody for, um, for coming here. I've had people come from far and wide, including some friends from Sydney, Australia. A lot of surprises, and it's really heartwarming to see all of you and all of us here celebrating the ILR School. The ILR School has meant a lot to me, and it's an honor for me to give back, because for me, Cornell and ILR are the gift that keep on giving. My daughter, ILR class of 2012, Amanda, my son Oliver, class of 2017, and my husband Mark Brossman, class of 1975, because he's older than me, <laughs> and a former a Groat winner, which makes us kind of a, a power couple. <laughs> and I got to meet Jerome Alburn tonight, and we discovered that where I grew up was about five minutes from the town he lives, and his daughter and I attended the same elementary school. So thank you, Jerome, for being such an important part of Cornell. <laughs> so for me, I, um, <clears throat> ILR opened up a learning window, and Cornell opened up a, wife, a life window. My life really changed by coming to Cornell it, in so many different ways. Now, I will confess that I might have applied to ILR because they didn't have a science requirement. <laughs> but it turned out that it was really the perfect place for me. It connected the dots of social sciences, which to this day I continue to study. I was able to look for patterns and interconnections and the interdisciplinary nature of the curriculum made it an exciting place to learn. And I really learned and I really, really like school. So um, as I've gone on, I've gotten maybe three graduate degrees. Um, I did go to the dark side and got one at Penn um, <laughs> in applied positive psychology. And I am happy to announce that in June, I am going to be beginning a doctoral program at Teachers College Columbia. I will be a 1,000 when I finish, but I'm very happy to be to continually to be in a learning community. It, it ignites my soul. So um, they say ILR loves, means I love reading. Well, I do love reading, and I do love writing, and I do love school. So as my curiosity took me in different directions, I ended up having a very unconventional career, like Alex said. Some might say career ADD. I've been a lawyer, a writer, I've worked in the nonprofit space, um, I've done a lot of um, public service through um, organizations. Um, I'm an executive coach, an organizational consultant, and a mediator. So I keep trying new things, but what when this journey actually is what led me to Penn in the program in um, Applied Positive Psychology. So for those of you who are not familiar with that field, it's the field of flourishing. Flourishing and thriving. In essence, what matters? And to me, to others, what do I matter? Do I matter to other people? Does the work that I do matter? And in the workplace, there's a, there's a side, a, offshoot from positive psychology called organization, positive organizational scholarship, which is indeed a mouthful, but it's really about how do we design organizations where not only do well but do good, where people can thrive in environments that um, ignite the mind and, and create new product and innovation, as well as um, figuring out what work means to us. So it's not just the how of work, but it's the why of work. Why do we choose what we do? What motivates us and invigorates us? How do we share that with other people? How do we remain in a competitive environment and find places of connection and points of opportunity with other people? And so how, it's a kind of an existential question. It's kind of lofty, but it actually informs our decision making and that informs our action. So I began to think about what constitutes a good life 
and I decided that I had one. So <clears throat> despite setbacks and appointment, disappointments along the way, I figured out that I was an optimist in pessimist clothing. Being a lawyer means I'm always looking at problems and issues, but deep down in my heart, I do believe things work, and I do think things work out for most people. And that made me think about the subject of luck. And so my husband always says, we're very lucky people. So luck always, to me, meant this sort of magical external thing that had nothing to do with me, that kind of fell on people. But the work of positive psychology has shown me some other ways of thinking about it, particularly the work of um, Charles Schneider and, J and Shane Lopez, who study hope and optimism. And they formulate that and reframe it in terms of thinking about willpower plus way power. Willpower is our grit and persistence and the goals that we pursue, and our way power is finding a path to get there. So we articulate our goals and intentions, and then we figure out how to bring them and make them real. So let, let, luck is not really about magic. It's about imagining possibilities and see, selecting and seeking and seizing opportunities that come our way with our eyes open to be available for those opportunities. So while my career has certainly not been a straight line trajectory by any means, I've really had the good fortune to be able to forge a path of my own and led by my interests, powered by persistence, and I've been able to stay curious and engaged, connect with a lot of incredible, wonderful people all over, and find meaning and purpose in work. And that brings us back to the world of work. Work matters, we matter when we work, the work we do matters, and with that, I thank you all, and again, my honor, and thank you, Jerome, for creating this award. Thank you, Diane. I'd like to thank both of our award recipients, Carolyn and Diane, for inspiring, inspirational words. Thank you again.